Well, thank you, Senator Daines and Team Montana and Joni, Senator Ernst, good to, good to see you. And I know that Senator Braun is uh, going to be here shortly. I want to speak about both of these pieces of legislation um, that we're going to be considering tomorrow uh, because both of them are really important. So to distinguish, as I know has been done a few times tonight, but just to, to be sure we're all on the same page, uh, Senator Graham's Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act uh, is a really important piece of legislation, and I think that my Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act that I know both of my colleagues here uh, who've just spoken are uh, original co-sponsors of as well. Really important piece of legislation, but they're distinct, and I think it's important uh, that we clarify for the American people and, and for them, or via the press, uh, for them how, how they differ. So these two bills are different, but they're connected by this simple question which is, will the Senate vote tomorrow to protect babies? This is about as straightforward a question as you could possibly have. Will the U.S. Senate vote tomorrow to protect babies? Let's talk first about Senator Graham's legislation. Every mom and dad knows what it's like uh, to see your child hurt, to, to see somebody fall down, maybe with something as minor as a, as a scraped knee. Um, or a burned hand uh, on the stove, or a finger slammed in a car door or a bedroom door. And you know that experience of the big, deep breath that's going to be followed by the piercing cry. Something drops in the pit of your stomach. Every parent knows this feeling. You want to scoop them up. You want to grab them. You want to hold them. You want to take away the pain. You'd take 10x the pain if you could uh, to protect your baby from that pain. You want to make it stop, and you want them to know that they're going to be OK. When your child hurts, you hurt. And it's far worse to watch your child hurting than to feel the pain yourself. And so we have this, this gut feeling when it comes to pain. When we see someone hurting, we know that this is not the way the world is supposed to be. Pain is not natural. This is not the order of things as it was meant to be. And so our heart leaps at the sight of someone in pain, not just a child, but especially when it's a child, a family member, a friend, or even a complete stranger. When you see somebody in pain, we want to make it stop. Human beings are compassionate. That is, we feel along with others. When they suffer, we suffer. And so we reach out to protect. We want to give comfort. Tomorrow, we have the opportunity to extend that reach of care and comfort and protection. The Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act would protect babies as early as 20 weeks into pregnancy. That's halfway through. By inscribing in law our responsibility to protect innocent babies in the womb from the pain that is inflicted by abortion. <clears throat> the responsibility that we have when a two-year-old skins her knee is also a responsibility that we have when a 20-year-old baby in the womb is threatened. The science is clear. Modern medicine is allowing surgeons to perform operations on in utero babies. And these intricate, amazing, amazing little operations available nowadays are saving the lives of thousands of babies with what would have once been fatal conditions. These surgeons frequently administer drugs to the baby, just like they do to the mother. These doctors are treating two patients, not just one, and they do everything in their power, not just to advance the health of both of the patients, but to protect both of the patients from pain. They want to be sure that both patients are safe and comfortable and as well cared for as possible. Science has shown us that these babies feel pain, and the Pain Capable Unborn Child Protection Act is a simple recognition that, although the baby in the womb might be mostly invisible to us, we are not blind to her needs. We have a responsibility to spread that umbrella of law over every vulnerable person, no matter how small. Size doesn't determine dignity or worth. So the question before us tomorrow is, will the US Senate vote to protect these babies? It's pretty simple. You're going to hear lots of crazy commentary talking about other stuff than what we're actually voting on tomorrow. But what we're voting on is, should the US Senate vote to protect these babies? I plan to vote in favor of compassion, because I believe that being pro-mom and pro-baby and being pro-science are all bundled up together. And so tomorrow, we're going to consider compassionate, pro-science, pro-baby legislation. And I implore my colleagues, all 100 of us, 
ought to be doing the same. But I also know that, although I am unapologetically pro-life, many of my colleagues in this body are not. And so tonight, I also want us to talk about a different piece of legislation. It's motivated by that same care, that same concern with having the U.S. Senate vote to protect babies, but it's actually a different piece of legislation than Senator Graham's important pro-life um, anti-abortion piece of legislation. And so I want to talk about this second piece of legislation. Even if you are unwilling to vote to defend unborn babies, I hope that my colleagues would at least consider joining with us in voting to protect babies that have already been born. So Senator Graham's legislation is about protecting babies in utero. We've got a second piece of legislation before us tomorrow that's about protecting babies after they've already been born. Will we acknowledge that a baby outside the womb should not be left to die? That's what the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act is actually about. One year ago tomorrow, the United States Senate sadly, shamefully, shrugged its shoulders at babies who had already been born after botched abortions. A bipartisan majority in this body, let's be clear, a bipartisan majority voted in favor of protecting these babies, but we didn't have enough votes, we didn't have enough folks voting with us in this chamber to break the filibuster in favor of infanticide. That's what happened a year ago tomorrow in this chamber. Today, there's nothing in our federal law that criminalizes the denial of care to a baby that survived an abortion. So when a baby lives through an abortion procedure and ends up born and is outside mom, there's nothing in federal law that criminalizes denying care to those babies and allowing her to die, allowing her or him to die. And we have to change that. So this second bill tomorrow is not actually about abortion. It's not about Roe v. Wade. It's, it's about something different. It's about what happens after an abortion that didn't succeed in terminating the baby's life. And so when a baby survives and is lying on that table, cold and naked and alone, what does our society do? Are we a country that protects babies that are alive, born and outside the womb after having survived a botched abortion? Are we a country that says it's okay to just sit back and allow that baby to die? That baby that's fighting for life, is it okay for us to just let that baby die? It's a plain and simple question. And we all know what the right answer is. There are hard calls that we consider in this body sometimes. There are a lot of gray issues. This isn't one of them. This isn't a hard call. Since last year's vote, we have brought before this body testimony from medical experts who have been involved in abortion procedures, who've had in their hands one-pound little babies that had survived abortions. That was the purpose of the Senate Judiciary Committee's hearing on this bill two weeks ago. In that, we heard testimony that made clear why this bill is necessary, and it made clear that the other side actually can't confront the arguments head on. Uh, that's what happened two weeks ago in the Senate Judiciary Committee. We were looking at the text of this bill. We had in front of us medical experts who had the experience with people who had babies who had survived abortions, and they talked about what happened in their clinics. And everybody who spoke against the Abortion Survivors Protection Act didn't talk about the bill at all. They talked about all these other things. Some of them are actually hard debates, but none of them had anything to do with the legislation that we were actually considering. That's because they couldn't actually defend opposing a bill that's purpose is simply to prohibit infanticide. That's why Planned Parenthood, NARAL, and the big abortion doctors lo lobby resorted to simple misinformation. That's all the hearing was by, by those who were opposed to the legislation. They say that what we're trying to do is prevent something that doesn't happen. That's not true. That's a myth. There are eight states where we have some reporting information. We should have reporting information from all 50 states. But in the eight states that we have, we have information about the babies that survive abortions and what happens to them. They wouldn't confront those facts, so they just made these blanket statements that this legislation deals with something that doesn't happen. But it does, which is why we had a hearing, why we brought in experts, and then they talked about, the opponents of this legislation talked about completely unrelated things. They said, there are no such things as abortion survivors. We'd like to introduce you to some of them. 
Perhaps they should also consult the CDC's records. For of the several states, I mentioned there were eight um, that report data on survivors. Or they should talk to the Abortion Survivors Network. They should look into the eyes of spouses and friends and neighbors and coworkers and parents who are abortion survivors, and they should try to tell them that what we're doing is pointless or a waste. They can't do that because their position is morally indefensible. Who are the spouses and friends and neighbors who are not here today because they did not receive life-saving medical care in their first moments of life? The terms of the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act are simple. A child born alive during a botched abortion would be given the same level of care that is provided to any other baby born at that same gestational stage. That's it. That's all the second piece of legislation we're going to deal with tomorrow does. It says when a baby survives an abortion, that baby should get the same level of medical care that's provided to any other baby at the same stage of gestational development. That's all it does. It doesn't create, as opponents charge, some mandate to prolong the suffering of a dying child. It doesn't do anything like that. It simply says, if a baby survives an abortion, it has to get the same level of medical care that would be provided to any other baby at the same stage of gestational care that had a parent present that wanted that baby. It doesn't force a doctor to do anything that violates medical best practice. It simply says that a baby who survives an abortion is a baby and should be treated as such, as a baby, with care and compassion. Do senators in this chamber believe their own campaign slogans? Our colleague from Vermont, who's on the verge of becoming the standard bearer for the Democratic Party in our country, has declared that, quote, the mark of a great nation is how it treats its most vulnerable people. Senator Sanders is right. America is dedicated to the proposition that all men and women, all boys and girls are created equal, even the littlest ones, even if they happen to come into the world in the most horrific of circumstances, even if they're crippled or inconvenient or unwanted. America recognizes the immeasurability, the immeasurable dignity of every human being, regardless of race or sex or creed or ability. If we're hemming and hawing about whether it's okay to let children die of neglect, we know we've lost part of our soul. Tomorrow, we have a chance to recognize and secure the dignity of some of the most vulnerable members of our society. We have a chance to protect those babies who come into the world under the worst of conditions, and we have the chance to extend to them the possibility of life and of love. Tomorrow, we can speak up for the voiceless. We can defend the defenseless. We can come to the aid of the innocent. This is not about Roe. This is not about politics. It's about a simple question. Will the United States Senate tomorrow stand for the proposition that babies are babies and they deserve care? Will the Senate vote tomorrow to protect babies?